Okay, so this Israeli Palestinian conflict intensifies. I know that there were some people who were uh, looking to hear what I had to say about the issue, considering my uh, support for Palestine. And of course, I'm still in support of Palestine. I believe that the people of Palestine deserve okay. emancipation, just like the people of Ukraine deserve emancipation. Uh, this is one of the most unjustifiable and unimaginable and ongoing acts of cruelty. And that cruelty, of course, is going to inevitably have some kind of blowback. This is what Israel and the Israeli citizens are currently experiencing. The unimaginable cruelty, a fraction of it being uh, being experienced. And, and, of course, the, the victims, the toll is taken upon the normal citizens. I'm not going to be one of those people that says, like, oh, they're settlers. They, do, they deserve the violence. They deserve, uh, uh, you know, getting shot in the streets. No, nobody deserves that. That is precisely the reason why I always criticize Israel. Obviously, nobody deserves that. But this is, of course, and this is, of course, going to happen. What do you think is going to happen when you have an open-air prison that you have been operating for years and years? When you bomb it, when you, when you operate an open-air prison that you routinely bomb, that you control the water supply, that you refuse to let concrete into, that you control the fucking uh, water line in general, that you stop, that you prevent people from fishing, that you, uh, that you have refused to allow to have desalination plants inside of, when 97% of the water supply is toxic, when the average age is 18, some of those kids, some of those men, and some of those kids, for the first time, experience something beyond the inner walls of Palestine, the inner walls of Gaza, for the first time ever. That is insane, okay? <sighs> I think there's a lot of people out there who are very passionate about what's going on, and, and I think that some people do not have uh, a good assessment on the situation, and they are, of course, immediately showing uh, that their, their uh, allegiances or their interest in emancipation for all peoples, freedom for all peoples, is entirely conditional, okay? And, um, you know, there are obviously still some incredibly brave people out there, but like I said, this is uh, asymmetrical violence. We are going to learn more about it because I think that people need to understand uh, what that looks like. Here is a good example of an Israeli left-wing Knesset member, okay? We condemn and oppose any assault on innocent civilians, but in contrast to the Israeli government, that means we must oppose any assault on Palestinian civilians as well. We must analyze those terrible incidents, the attacks in the right context, and that is the ongoing occupation, Kassif said. We have been warning time and time again, everything is going to erupt and everyone is going to pay a price, mainly innocent civilians on both sides. And unfortunately, that is exactly what happened, he said. The Israeli government, which is a fascist government, this is true, supports, encourages, and leads pogroms against the Palestinians, also true. There's an ethnic cleansing going on. It was obvious the writing was on the wall, written in the blood of the Palestinians, and unfortunately now Israelis as well. If you recall, when Israel was having its own constitutional crisis, one thing that I brought up, as, as well as many other leftists who are very familiar with Israel, have either lived in Israel or, uh, or, or have, uh, you know, a lot of experience with Israeli politics, said the exact same thing. They said these kinds of internal struggles, okay, are never going to end because these internal struggles are not born out of mere disagreements between different parties. These internal struggles are happening because this is happening inside an apartheid state. Um, this is one of the best answers to, uh, to, to the, the supposedly, supposedly complex problem of what is going on in Israel. This is Michael Brooks. I'm going to mention it. I'm going to show you uh, what Michael Brooks said, and we are going to continue uh, uh, on with our coverage. But obviously, uh, first and foremost, like I said, uh, do we know if the was released? No. Um, uh, I am going to first give the uh, I'm going to first give the, the short uh, Michael Brooks clip on it. Rest in power to Michael Brooks, Michael Jamal Brooks uh, on the Israeli apartheid. I think this is probably a really uh, really good framework for a lot of people who have no way of comprehending the situation to understand a a role reversal, if you will. It's not complicated. That's the big thing. It's super simple. There's one group that has enormous power. It's the most powerful country in the Middle East, backed by the United States. It acts on another population of people with total impunity and has never held accountable for anything. So there's no symmetry in the relationship. Period. And just as like a thought experiment, IDW people. If we know that if somehow a population of Jewish refugees ended up in West Bank and Gaza, and an Arabic government in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv had an open air prison in what you know Jewish Gaza, which they bombed with white phosphorus, they killed civilians indiscriminately, and they had no uh, provisions for medicine, they had an embargo that blocked food, that the electricity wasn't running, that there was over 48 percent unemployment rate, life expectancy and malnutrition statistics were horrifying. The uh, one of the major uh, policymakers in this hypothetical Arabic Palestinian state said we need to put those Jews on a diet. In the West Bank, there was another Jewish area where there was a little bit more autonomy, but there was regular Arabic settlements where they pulled up the Jewish farmers' foods, they terrorized them with rocks, the security forces broke children's bones, and they couldn't drive them on the roads. We all have no problem understanding what that was. So there's nothing complex about this. The second part of your question, it's, it's a pure asymmetry relationship. It's not complex. He's absolutely correct. Um, Michael Brooks passed away in 2020 due to a pulmonary embolism, uh, unfortunately. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not that complex if you are aware of the situation for, I mean, since the inception of the Israeli state, but certainly if you are aware, if, even at the very least since like the past 20 years, I would say, Benjamin Netanyahu is perhaps one of the worst things that could have happened to a colonial state that uh, only increased in its brutality over the course of Benjamin Netanyahu's tenure. Um, this is something that even Israelis inside of Israel, despite how much uh, anger they feel towards Palestinians, also recognize. Benjamin Netanyahu has built a robust far-right network that he, he took advantage of and seized power once again. If you want to understand it from the perspective of like internal politics, that is your guy. He is bloodthirsty and violent and has made Israel somehow an even more uh, bloodthirsty nation-state. And now he has right-wing figures to his right, like Ben Gavir, who are causing actual collapses internally inside of Israel. However, yes, Kahan is perverts. If you, if you, you're an Israeli person, if you're an Israeli citizen, if you are living in Israel and you do not recognize that those internal rifts are happening only because Israel is also an apartheid state, the, the spiritual damage that it causes to everyday existence, I don't know what to tell you. I've said it time and time again. It's just like how white supremacy kills white people as well, okay? This violence will never end. I know this because I'm an American and I live in America and I know, I see it. Israel, obviously, due to its proximity to the violence itself, due to its uh, closeness to the, the apartheid that it's currently facilitating, uh, cannot see it. America rests on top of indigenous genocide and slavery and yet these, there are racial wounds that have yet to be healed. That is the reason why we are constantly fucking ourselves, okay? Israel in its inception and in, at this stage is also going through that uh, tumultuous period. Can you explain why people are supporting Israel? I'm scared. What do you mean? The Western world has always... I need to be
What is his own? Been in support of Israel and will always be in support of Israel. If you want to understand the divide inside of the, the divide on the planet, um, yes, the global south for the most part will always, global south or colonized people will oftentimes support Palestine and Palestinian liberation and developed nation states that have engaged in colonial violence throughout their history and still continue to engage in neo-colonial violence to this day that benefit from the unequal exchange within the global south will always support Israel, both financially, with military support, and, and yeah, that's it. Except for India. India is the one place, which I'm sure you guys have seen. India and Indian Twitter turned into, uh, it created some of the most interesting uh, uh, political dynamics I've ever seen. We will, of course, talk about that as well. Like, you literally have dudes with Adolf Hitler avatars being like, my name is Adolf Hitler, I love Adolf Hitler, and also, I am supporting Israel unconditionally, kill these Muslim Palestinian dogs. This is literally what I've seen time and time again. Mm -hmm. it's, most, it's the most insane thing I have ever seen in my entire life, and for some reason, like, there was a right-wing India account that basically said, we should nuke Palestine, which it is too you know, it's interesting because it's like, I don't know if you know this, but like, if you nuke Palestine, Israel would also be nuked. There is no way to nuke Gaza without nuking Israel. Uh, so, you know. That's something that they need to understand. Um, of course, uh, the, the uh, Indian-Israeli relationship is a one-sided one. Uh, it, is not a, it is not a relationship that has uh, any kind of... <laughs> it's not a relationship that is reciprocated. American geography takes. Lol, are you new to politics? So that's, a, that's an interesting perspective to also uh, consider. So yeah, here, this, is what I, uh, this is what I said, uh, back, uh, launching off of what Israeli journalist Gideon Levi said on the BBC. First, I will show you what he said. This is immediately after when, when uh, the Israeli government tried to retaliate against uh, Gazans. Uh, here's what he said, and then I'll tell you what, I, what my perspective is, again, so you understand. Gaza is a cage. It's the biggest prison in the world. Nobody spoke about lifting the siege. And you know, people who live now 17 years in a cage, want to resist, and if they have the possibility, they do it. And I'm surprised that they have the possibility, because the barrier, I know the barrier around Gaza, billions of, of dollars were spent there to build this unbelievable barrier under the surface and above the surface with all kinds of electronic devices, and finally you see that the spirit of resistance is many times stronger than anything else, and they broke it and penetrated into Israel, which is now shocked. Yeah, um, this is not me saying it, it's an Israeli journalist in the BBC saying it, in the immediate aftermath of a massive, of a massive military operation inside of the borders of Israel that has never happened before, with many civilians dying, okay, and a ton of hostages that they took, to which I responded with, and this was still my perspective, there is no perfect retaliation to apartheid. There are only victims everywhere. One party holds all the power to end the violence, however, and it's certainly not the Palestinians living under a colonial apartheid regime that has chained them in an open-air prison. It bombs routinely. And there are plenty of people, there are plenty of people who refuse to see that and say, well, um, you know, they really blew it. I saw a lot of people saying they really blew it. The Palestinians really blew it. The backlash is going to be so bad. They're going to end up killing a bunch of Palestinians. To them, I say, do you think this calculation is not in the minds of Palestinians? You can push humans only so far until they realize that this is their only method. They will go out on their own terms in this regard. You want to stop the violence, you want to stop the bloodshed, you have to, you have to pull back on your end. Because this violence and this bloodshed is disproportional. The violence is asymmetrical. People say, people try to make this distinction between Hamas and Palestinians. You are completely oblivious to the reality. Hamas is a, uh, is a Muslim Brotherhood fundamentalist cutout. It also happens to be the only popular form of governance amongst Palestinians. Do you want to know why that is the case? Do you want to examine the reason as to why Palestinians, who are comprised of incredibly diverse backgrounds, are now looking at a, a fundamentalist group of, of Islamists, for the most part, as their only savior? Do you think that it is important to analyze that situation? Or do you think it's easy to just say, let's separate Hamas from the Palestinian plight, let's separate Hamas and their actions, they are different. This is, the reason why people do this is because they want to support Palestinian people, but they think the only support Palestinian people can get is if they are perfect victims. If they just sit back and die, except the media rarely ever covers it when that happens for year after year after year, when they march peacefully to that same border wall so they can peacefully return, which is their right, and they get sniped in the thousands. When it's like little kids, 14-year-olds, nurses, they get sniped and they get fucking killed, and nobody ever makes a peep, pregnant women dying because they peacefully march. The greatest comparison is, the greatest comparison to the circumstances mm -hmm. Invoc invoking more sense. is either to Algeria and its violent struggle against colonial uh, French occupation, or uh, Nelson Mandela and the ANC fighting against apartheid. So today, I also want to cover the, the, the often forgotten, often whitewashed history of the struggle against South African apartheid. Because the ANC, the African National Congress, originally was a peaceful movement. Okay? It was a peaceful movement, and they were peacefully resisting against this unjustifiable apartheid state, and yet it got to a point where, you know, 69, uh, 69 black people were butchered, mercilessly slaughtered, where even Nelson Mandela realized that it is not necessarily just a struggle it, when all other opportunities are lost, when there is no other way to push back against a colonial state, an apartheid state that is unjustifiably treating you like a second-class citizen, then you must engage in violent struggle. Violence, as I've always said, is a constant in politics. It's a constant in politics. It's unchanging. Nelson Mandela was on the U.S. FBI terrorist watch list until 2008, long after he had won and had actually changed, or not changed rather, but moved to immediately facilitate peace in South Africa. 2008, he was democratically elected as a leader in 1994, and until 2008, he was still considered a terrorist. Nelson Mandela was offered freedom after being jailed, I believe, in 1967, after uh, he went to Algeria and Ethiopia and learned about the violent struggle against colonial occupation and came back and said the people deserve, the people demand uh, uh, emancipation, and they are willing to take matters into their own hands, and there is no other way to do this, okay? We have debated for far too long. There's no more room for debate. There's no more room for civil disobedience. This does not work. And they jailed him. They jailed him while, while his supporters still continued their acts of violence. Now, let me tell you something. The world branded them terrorists. The world branded Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. He was on the terrorist watch list until 2008. Remember that. In that entire process, there were moments where there was also a lot of, especially in the aftermath of the dissolution of the USSR, where people were realizing that there was no longer uh, the threat of communism. People wanted change in South Africa. And there was a robust boycott, divestment, and sanction move, a movement, a peaceful movement to boycott, divest, and sanction the state of South Africa as long as it continues its apartheid. This movement actually took hold and it applied external pressure 
foreign capital chose to pull out of South Africa. So both of these factors, violence on the ground and external pressure, caused an ally, caused an ally of the United States, an ally of the West, uh, in a deeply anti-communist state that engaged in a, a, a never-ending, uh, engaged in a never-ending continued violent military apparatus that forcibly oppressed black people, treated them as second-class citizens. It finally ended. But throughout that duration, Nelson Mandela was told on not one, but two different occasions, 10 years apart, if you condemn the violence, we will let you go free. ANC at the time was still banned, the African National Congress, okay? The ANC at the time was banned. Nelson Mandela the first time said, how can you negotiate with me when I am still chained in prison? I will not concede. Once again, I believe in 1985, the last time they, they went to Nelson Mandela and said, we will free you if you denounce Marxism, if you denounce communism, and if you denounce the violence that your supporters are engaging in. And he said, through his daughter, no, I will not denounce Marxism, I will not denounce communism, and I will not denounce the violent actions that people are engaging in as long as the apartheid continues, as long as we are not able to participate in political action, I will, I will stay in prison. And they had to concede at the end. They had to release him from prison, and he became uh, the president. This is very important to understand, because anti-colonial struggle is not pretty. Anti-colonial struggle is going to have a lot of unnecessary and, and horrifying acts of violence, okay? Mandela was not a tanky LMFAO. It's something you can say now, just like Martin Luther King was a revisionist. Why can you say that? Because we have whitewashed his history. Nobody, most people do not know the history of Nelson Mandela because they only know Nelson Mandela as the guy who uh, went up and played nice with the same prosecutor who fucking threw him in jail and wanted to give him the death penalty. You know him as the leader of South Africa. You do not know him as the revolutionary figure of South Africa. That is by design because if you knew him as a revolutionary figure, by the way, I love being like Nelson Mandela is not a tanky because if you use the terminology tanky, then yes, Nelson Mandela would fit that 100,000%, just so you know. Yeah. Hey, Algerian here, the National Liberation Front had to literally move away from the countryside of the mountains of northern Algeria to the cities. The movie Battle of Algiers showcases the brutal reality of decolonialization by taking the fight of the settlers themselves. It's an unfortunate reality, but that's how it's been historically speaking. Absolutely. Why am I talking about this? Because it's not that far. It's not, it's not that far off in history, and it's important to reframe this perspective because a lot of people see the violent reaction to an apartheid state, and if you are not aware of the endless violence of facilitating said apartheid state, you think, wow, this is unprovoked. I cannot believe how unprovoked this is. That is by design, okay? This is not unprovoked. There is no unprovoked violence in this circumstance. It is absolutely unimaginably ahistorical to consider this a violent action that is completely unprovoked. The only reason why you can get away with saying that is if you are completely oblivious to the reality. Um, oh, this was an interesting, I mean, this is going to take one. Passing resistance adopted Marxism to support the USSR. The Western media said they are fanatic agents of communism, okay? Which was, of course, a terrifying prospect for them uh, and for Israel as well. So they decided there's a better counterbalance there, Islamist fundamentalists. When Arab resistance groups adopted the Islamic ideology and received support from Iran, the same media said they are religious fanatical agents of Iran. The reality is they're always going to be religious and fanatical, or they're always going to be considered fanatical because to push back against an apartheid state requires fanaticism. Okay, a lot of people have had a lot of takes on the matter, and none of which none of which is tempered, none of which is reasonable. It's understandable that it's not reasonable if you are living in fucking Israel, obviously. Okay, not that it's correct, because there are still plenty of people living in Israel, living outside of Israel that do have the tempered, reasonable perspective that recognizes the reality of uh, the the colonial uh, violence that has caused this circumstance. Okay. Oh, this town hall is, is incredible as well. I remember this. I think is this the one where they tell him why do you support Yasser Arafat? Why do you support uh, Fidel Castro? Fidel Castro was incredibly formative in Nelson Mandela's like political development. Um, they say like why do you fucking support any these people? And he goes, why do you think I? You're, why do you think your enemies are supposed to be my enemies? Said that the government perceives itself in South Africa as being part of the anti do <laughs> you really think Hamas is fighting for Palestinian people? I am not Palestinian, okay? I don't know if you know this. My name is Hassan. I am Muslim. I'm Turkish, so a lot of people might get that confused, especially right now, because you're like, oh, this guy's fucking, okay, uh, you know, okay. probably a Muslim guy. Uh, you know, who knows? I am not Palestinian. So, for me, the only assessment I can make is that, yes, Hamas is an, a fundamentalist group, okay? Palestine is an incredibly diverse area. Is in, in, well, historically, was a very yeah, something on and on, on the Muslim thing where Jews, Christians, and Muslims live there under uh, the the uh, Ottoman rule. Okay, it is not me saying Hamas represents the interests of the Palestinian people. Hamas represents Palestinian vengeance according to the Palestinian people because that violent retribution is the only way that they can see uh, is the only way they see out of the struggle. Palestinians consider Hamas to be the only government formation that is at least in some way, shape, or form protecting them. They are fully aware that every single time Hamas does something, that fucking Israel counters with a uh, violent retribution that is tenfold. Okay, do not take their autonomy away by being like, oh, this is a separate moment. This is a separate instance. I, I make no mistake. The actions that happened yesterday are not simply actions that happened yesterday are not simply Hamas. If you think that it's simply Hamas, uh, and you are a leftist or you're a radical po uh, person who believes in radical uh, politics or at least aesthetically believes in radical politics, you are not seeing the entire. You're not seeing the entire picture. Were there brutal, unjustifiable acts of violence that uh, civilians had to endure? Absolutely, absolutely. I've seen the fucking videos. I know. I saw the girl with the dreads in the back of the pickup truck. That shit is completely unacceptable. Okay, that might not represent the interests of the Palestinians, but that is violent retribution that was an inevitability. Okay, it's violence is unstoppable in that situation. If all you know is violence, if all you have withstood is violence, if every single moment of your life is violent. Okay, some fucking douchebags are going to behave in that regard. Uh, whereas uh, during a, a military operation, they don't even have a decent standing military. They don't have anything. They have no rules of engagement. They don't have fucking a standing military. They literally built these little tin cans, okay, that they strapped a fucking parachute to so they could fly over the Israeli smart border. You think those motherfuckers have any like a uh, like? You think those guys uh, have like a uh, like a decent understanding of, of, uh, of how to to make sure that like uh, a lot of white Western leftists will uh, be able to continue defending them PR wise? Of course not. They're angry. They're reacting to the violence that is their constant lives. Okay, they have nothing. They have nothing left. I've said this already. Is religion making them think that they can actually win? They're truly delusional. Yeah, dude, totally. It's, it's definitely religion to them. They are retaliating for the first time uh, directly inside the border walls of their, of their prisoners. They make no distinction, which is wrong because there is a distinction. Of course there is. Like, these are people born on the other side of a border wall that 
uh, who knows what their fucking perspective is, you know what I mean? They could literally be anti, anti-Zionists living inside of Israeli borders. That is, there are plenty of them out there, okay? You don't know. You can look for nuance in the situation, but I need you to understand. That, that wasn't a peace festival. That was just like a regular pe- festival, by the way. Like, uh, the, that, that is just like massaging the narrative, which is still unacceptable. 250 people dying in a fucking, in a, in a, in a festival is ridiculous. It's awful. It's just a music festival. You just heard people say it's a peace festival because every, every little minutia counts, okay? Here, uh, this is another thing I wrote on Discord. I'll read it. I said, uh, because many people were saying like, oh, you know, Israel's gonna retaliate, Israel's gonna retaliate. Um, two things I said were, remember, Palestinians have nothing, no control over their supplies of water or electricity. Their peaceful coexistence project in the West Bank has led to a tremendous amount of bloodshed and displacement. Because there's the other side of this. Everyone says, oh, they lost the PR battle, they lost the PR battle. There is no PR battle in this circumstance. I hope you understand that. In their perspective, in their eyes, they are living in hell every single fucking day. So there is no PR battle. They don't give a shit about what our perspective is out here. You need to understand that. You want to know why? Because on the PR front in the West Bank, okay, for years and years and years, Israel has only taken, Israel has only partitioned, Israel has only bullied, Israel has only displaced hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, an act of settler colonial terrorism that even Israel, if you go back to the fucking 90s, uh, would, would, would turn a blind eye to, okay? Because they thought, oh, those are just the religious kooks that think that West Bank belongs to Israel too. And now that is the norm. Now, they first, they turned a, they turned a blind eye. When houses were getting bulldozed in the West Bank, none of those people fucking did anything, okay? The West Bank Palestinians weren't the ones who were violently uh, pushing back against Israel. They were peacefully coexisting, okay? This is important to understand. They were peacefully coexisting under an apartheid regime, okay? They built illegal settlements. First they said, why are we giving money to these fucking religious groups? That's what they said inside of Israel. They said, these guys are fucking weird. They're gross. They're going over to the West Bank. Let's not even, they're freeloaders. Why are we giving them any money? But the state had different opinions. First, they said, we'll turn a blind eye to it. Then they brought in the bulldozers. Then they protected the bulldozers. Then they started building partitions on West Bank territory. They started cementing their fucking water wells. They started building partitions. They set up security checkpoints and they became the military security apparatus in West Bank. So don't fucking tell me that when you're peacefully trying to coexist with Israel, they let you fucking peacefully coexist. Because what is going on in the West Bank is nothing but violence. Not to the same degree as Gaza, but certainly just as fucking violent at the end of the day. If you live in West Bank and you're a Palestinian and you fucking leave West Bank, you can't get back in. You are not allowed. Your life is fucking ruined. You've watched your own cities, towns, villages turn into parking lots, Israeli parking lots, where motherfuckers from Brooklyn come in and live there for free because it's government sponsored. It's nice free real estate. So don't tell me peaceful coexistence can happen, okay? You can literally look at the West Bank to see what peaceful coexistence looks like. Those guys are leading the charge on PR. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything, and yet they get bullied by settlers on a daily fucking basis. And now Ben Gavir and his fucking that Kahana's dog is able to control and, and, and make the situation in West Bank even more insane. And that aggressive violence in the West Bank is what happened to lead to this incredibly unimaginable military action that took place in southern Israel, and it's still ongoing. They took over precincts. They killed a bunch of fucking commanders. How do you think that happened? This is one of the most well-guarded per capita, like per ounce of land areas on the fucking planet. Because they got so horny on their endless conquest and violence of the West Bank that they did not look in their own fucking backyard. There's a reason why Palestinians look at the PLO and think that they're fucking Israel's own people, okay? They are unpopular. The West Bank leadership is completely unpopular. Do you want to know why? Because they see the leadership as just another cutout of the Israeli apparatus. They see that leadership as letting West, uh, Palestinians in the West Bank get fucking slaughtered. They watch every day as dudes that don't live in fucking Israel or Palestine that flew in from like Brooklyn or fucking Long Island or wherever the fuck fly in and forcibly take their own fucking homes and tell them, sorry, this is mine now, okay? And then you can't push back. You can't push back because the police force is an occupying military apparatus that comes in and fucking kills you. So tell me, how is peaceful coexistence going in the West Bank? It's not. This is why the people of Palestine have no one to turn to but Islamist fundamentalists like Hamas, which isn't simply a terror cell, but also the governing body that was democratically elected in fucking Gaza, okay? It's not like those guys see the world eye to eye with someone like Isn't Hamas a terrorist? Myself, I am not aligned with Hamas, but time and time again, I have said this exact same thing. Okay, you have to remember when imperialist actions occur in your country, the most reactionary elements are seen as those who will fight back. They will be seen as the violent liberators. You will galvanize them. And inside of Palestine, this was by design. They neutered and executed all the fucking socialist revolutionaries, every single one, until all that remained was the the, the Mossad-backed fundamentalists. And now that's what all of these people want. That all these people want is liberation, and the only people that will give them that, or at least it's the only way. Only to eat because of Hamas. Fight back so they die on their own terms is that government apparatus and its uh, formation, its military formation. So remember that. Like I said, there's so much bloodshed and displacement occurring in the supposedly peaceful side of things where Israel is objectively, like by the rest of the world, in the wrong 100%. Okay? When you're back into a corner with all your socialist revolutionaries purged, with no allies of foreign nations, the Palestinian people have no one other than a violent Muslim brotherhood cut out fundamentalist organization that are, is now being seen as liberators. Okay? They're, they're, they have nothing. They have nothing. You've done a peaceful protest. They get killed. They get arrested. This is before we consider, like, the, the, uh, the, 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 like, the violent existence. I mean, here, this is, a, this is an example I've shown you before. Okay, here you go. Here's the PR. Okay, here's the PR that you see. Here is the daily life of a Palestinian living in the fucking West Bank. I'm my house. I don't see it, someone else can see it. No, no one, no one uh, is allowed to see that, Yami. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? What are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But you, it's you, easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. You That's are nice. stealing my house. There you go. I mean, that's remember, this is not Gaza. This is not Gaza. This is West Bank. Okay, this is fucking West Bank. This is the this is the, the peaceful coexistence. This is Israel allowing Palestinians to exist in an area that they should have no business being inside of. So how does that work? Tell me how that works. And let me tell you, you want to know? You want to know something? There you go. Thousands of Israelis are seen headed to the Ben Gurion airport as they prepare to escape because they can do that. When Gaza gets bombed and, and Benjamin Netanyahu says, uh, you know, move inside of Gaza because we're going to bomb certain areas and do military operations, Palestinians have nowhere to go. This is their home. 
This is where they've been pushed into. They, they can't just fucking fly out of, uh, of Gaza. There's no flying out of Palestine, especially because if you're in the fucking West Bank and you are Palestinian and you fly out of the West Bank, you can't come back in. They will, because their goal is to displace you. But yeah, if you're, if you are uh, Israeli and living in the West Bank in territory that you, you do not own inside of someone else's home that you bulldozed and built your own on top of, you can comfortably leave in an airplane, uh, in, a, in an AC airplane, okay, with air conditioning and go back to fucking Europe. You can go back to Brooklyn, go back to Long Island, you go back. This is a vacation. Why are the people in the settlers stealing house videos speak English? What do you mean? Uh, again, go back. That's kind of Why do you think? Why do you think this guy has a, a, like, a, like a New York accent? That motherfucker's from Brooklyn. We know. We know who he is because he's an American. He's like, oh yeah, well, you know, it's expensive. Rent's expensive in New York. So I just want a summer home or whatever. So I'm gonna fucking go to I'm gonna go to West Bank. You immigrated and reside on stolen native land. This is actually 100% true. You are correct. Okay. The difference is there wasn't someone living here. Okay. When I when I came here. At this point, that's what happens when you do. That's what happens when you do fucking colonial violence like the United States did. He was living on fucking uh, it, the, the aftermath of indigenous genocide in America. But I guess that wasn't enough. That he wanted to do his own in fucking West Bank against indif people who can't defend themselves. I love people saying that. Yeah. I displaced native New Jerseyans. Let me let me explain another. I want to show you another video because I think it perfectly captures like something that um, Americans or people living in the Imperial Core, people living in the West, don't fully understand. They can't fully grasp that is like a normal existence and a part of like everyday existence for uh, Palestinians. Okay. Under uh, occupied. Uh, West Bank. How can you look at Israeli mom and two-year-old keeping Captain Gaza and justify it? Did I say that? Did I say that that's justifiable? I did not. You heard that because that's the only fucking way you can defend violent colonial apparatus every single day, brutalizing many fucking children many times over on the Palestinian side, which you turn a blind eye to. I never justified it. Shut the fuck up. You said that because you can't defend it. You can't defend that unless you fucking say, so condemn it. I did. That violence is completely unjustifiable. Okay. But guess what? It's also inevitable. And if Israeli leftists, even inside of the Knesset, can understand that, you living in America should be able to comprehend it too. Okay. But you can't because for you, it's just moving parts. And one side, is always supposed to be the victim of asymmetrical violence, and the other side can per can, can be the purveyors of said violence and, and live in a constant state like that, and it's perfectly fine and dandy. Wait, no, this isn't what I was talking about. This is the checkpoints, but that's not what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, this is like this is West Bank. This is West Bank. This is uh, this is the peaceful coexistence. There must be Palestinian workers of Israeli settlements. Look at the workers. Look at their faces. No one is happy. All of them are in debt. Here they line up single file to be filtered through checkpoints and all by entry away from land they consider is occupied by Israel. Is there anyone in the world who commutes to work at 3 30 a.m.? Most here, there is little choice but to work their occupies. Here in the West Bank, the real news networks work to workers on the ground. This is what I wanted to show you, okay? Before, like, that checkpoint is just, like, a, a part of daily existence, but there's more. Because that is the violent military apparatus forcing partitions upon land that you previously thought were yours, right? As the entire world looks on. So that part is a, is a part of daily existence, but it goes further than that. This is Betzalem. Uh, here is a, a video that Betzalem posted on Twitter, which I think is very informative for you to understand that it goes beyond the violent military apparatus as well. Uh, here, here it is. Israeli settlers who invaded Palestinian farmland and were stopped by his owner, bullying and attacking in front of soldiers in Bani Naim in the Hebron district on the 10th of August, 2023. I remember watching this when it first came out. He says, hey, why are you, he says, why are you coming to me? These guys are not the military. These guys are militarized settlers, okay? And Ben Gavir has made this so fucking normal, okay? I need you to understand. This shit is too extreme for even Israelis living in Israel. What they're doing right now is considered completely unjustifiable, even by motherfucking Israelis who are currently baying for blood, okay? Just remember that. Like, imagine your entire nation state was designed by imperial partitioned land, okay? So you, you technically have, like, lived in existence of, of settler colonialism, and you look at these guys and you go, nah, dog, these guys are out of fucking control. Why the fuck are we giving them money? These guys are the most passionate psychopaths, okay? Look at this guy. He's got a fucking, like, look at him. He's just kidded out talking to a Palestinian who he fucking stopped and is operating like he's a part of the military or some shit. He's not. He says, get away, do you want to shoot me? Shoot me. You see it, you hear it. He says, shoot me. What are you going to do, kill me? Just fucking kill me. They're just going through shit. Open his car. So this is my land. Don't come here anymore. Do you understand? We didn't do anything that's not allowed. He says, we, we bought this land. He goes, nah, nah, you didn't. I don't give a shit. Look at this fucking face. He says, we worked on this land with our sweat and brow. <laughs> so this guy has no other... Like, can you imagine? This is not a cop, bro. This is not a fucking cop. But yeah, if you look at the situation and you, and you defend his existence, this is every fucking day, okay? This is every goddamn day. It's not just a violent military apparatus. It's literally, literally, just these motherfuckers just like taking matters in their own hands. <laughs> like, understand that. The reason why I like this video, the reason why it's so maddening, is because this personalizes the, the everyday existence of living in a fucking a partitioned land by a, a violent colonial apartheid state that defends these kinds of actions. He's fucking booping his face, got the New York Yankees hat on, you know what I mean? It's just, look at that, look how fucking disrespectful it is, because to him, that guy is not a human being. He's just a plaything in that moment, okay? You can fucking, you can just do whatever you want to him. You wanna know why? Because when he calls the fucking cops, it's the motherfucking IDF. It is an occupying force that's gonna come in and defend them. They are there to defend this guy, okay? They're not there to, to issue justice. They're there to defend him, and in most cases, literally arrest the Palestinian every single fucking time. <laughs> no, these aren't military people. These are regular settler terrorists, okay? <laughs> he said he's forbidden. He's not a police officer, he's not a soldier. Why are you searching my car? You know why he's searching his car? Because he has a fucking AR-15. That's why he gets to do uh, what he's doing. And there's nothing you can do. He can just shoot you and kill you right there. And many have. That's the other part of it. Settlers fucking kill Palestinians all the goddamn time. You want to know what happens to them? Yeah. Nothing. Rarely do they ever actually go to prison for that. Rarely. Think about that. 
Think about that existence, dude. Think about living and, and your neighbor just like fucking came here uh, and, and took your cousin's apartment, okay? And now he can just come over and like fuck you up. Same as Hamas. It should be nice to have an example there. Hamas is a fucking ridiculous equivalence, okay? Hamas does not have the firepower, the manpower. Oh, the, at least a study or something. The, the military apparatus Hamas has nothing, okay? That's why when they fucking flew into Israel, they didn't use F-16s, okay? And this is not even Gaza. You're looking at West Bank. You're looking at settler violence in an area that everybody understands Israel should have no business being inside of, and yet it is. This is what peaceful coexistence looks like. These are the people that don't do anything. They just get fucking bullied, ritualistically humiliated, okay, and killed in a lot of instances and displaced. You are desperate to say, look at Hamas, look at Hamas, Hamas does the same shit. There is no Hamas here, okay? Israel conditionally releases Palestinians uh, detained over deadly Israeli settler raid. 19-year-old Palestinian killed athlete by Jewish settler. Incident was condemned by the U.S. as a terrorist attack. Settlers say they acted in self-defense after rocks were thrown. The expansion of settlements has seen rising violence. This is everyday existence, man. On the other side, the military actions are unimaginable. As, as we as we speak, are still Palestinians deep inside of southern Israel positions that have taken over military checkpoints, that have taken over police precincts, okay? This has not happened before. This is so unimaginable. Israel and the Israeli authorities never thought that it could happen. Now, I've talked to some people about this to understand, like, to get a better perspective of how this happened, how this could have possibly happened. And for the most part, including, you know, Chris Cappy, uh, who uh, is from Task and Purpose, and, and many, like, you know, a diverse background of people, people with military experience, people with experience in, uh, in, in uh, Palestine, people with experience in Israel. And the, the, <laughs> the, the overwhelming narrative is that after years and years of occupation um, and, and heavily relying on tech, the Israeli forces got too arrogant and never expected this. They got so arrogant and, and they, they just did not expect this at all. Where they, they got complacent, they got arrogant, they moved, their, they moved their military apparatus to the West Bank to do the shit that I'm showing you right now to defend that, to defend uh, these kinds of actions because there's a lot more happening there that, is like, that needs uh, additional military support. The, the uh, supposed greatest counterinsurgency, uh, the, the greatest counterinsurgency military apparatus turned into a violent Gestapo force internally. So when you get too comfortable doing that, you forget basic border protection and things of that nature. That is yet another instance of living under a violent colonial rule in an apartheid state, okay? That is where the fascist, uh, the, the, the fascist convergence creates problems with respect to internal security, okay? Do you, you get it? That's because of how fucking far right the Israeli government has become. That it does not offer basic securities to its own citizens because they're too fucking horny to keep doing more blood and soil conquest in the West Bank. Oh, I do not think that Netanyahu and Mossad knew this was going to happen and let it happen. Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why I don't think so? Because currently, first of all, this is a massive fuck up for them. This, there's already so much internal rift inside of Israel. And yes, military operations oftentimes galvanize Israelis who will say, all right, we have a security problem here and we have to do something about it. We have to go kill some Palestinians. However, this moment is a legitimate, uh, is, is a, it demonstrates the fragility of Israeli security. Okay? So many commanders died. Uh, so many special forces people died. There are hundreds of hostages now inside of Gaza. And the, the official leadership in Palestine said, we have these hostages specifically because whatever violence you dish out to us, they will experience. They wanted to minimize, as far as I understand, the, the, the damage that Israel could cause to Gaza, okay? That's why they did it. That's why they took these fucking hostages and they said they placed them all around Gaza. Where they said, look, you think an Israeli's life is more important than a Palestinian's life? We all know that. So go ahead. Bomb us if you will, but you will be killing your own people. Now, for those of you who don't understand what this means, last time, an Israeli, one singular Israeli military person was kidnapped by Hamas. Israel released 1,000 prisoners in that prisoner exchange. 1,000. He was, he was one fucking, one military person. Because in their eyes, it's worth it. 1,000 uh, Palestinians is worth the life of one Israeli. So now they have hundreds. And not just Israelis, but even, uh, from what I understand, foreign nationals as well from the festival that they uh, raided on. That is something to consider. There are forces inside of Israel that are now saying things like this. When genocide is permissible, judging by the numbers of casualties on both sides, it's almost a one-month-old uh, war. I mean, this is from 2014. This is back from 2014. There are, there are, uh, this is not the only person, there's another dude in the Knesset who said, we are going to do the Nakba again, and it's going to be much more violent than the former Nakba, okay? It's going to be much worse than that. We are, like, there are, there are people internally that are baying for blood. There have been, uh, closed-door meetings inside of Israel. People are calling this for a good military overview, but I can't say for sure. Okay, hold on, we'll, we'll look at the military overview in a second. But, um, uh, there, there have been closed-door meetings where the, the most far-right elements are literally saying, we'll kill our own hostages, it doesn't matter, okay? We'll kill our own hostages if we have to, it doesn't fucking matter. Now, if, if you do that, it's over for Israel. If you kill Israeli citizens that were taken hostage inside of Gaza with Israeli bombs, Israel as a nation state will collapse one million percent. Right now, there is there are way too many far right forces inside of the Israeli government, and plenty of people fucking despise them for understandable reasons. Okay, I'm not. I, this is my speculation. If the ultra nationalist forces are able to literally fucking uh, uh, you know wipe out the entirety of Gaza and kill hundreds of Israeli hostages in that situation, Israel internally already is a powder keg. There will be mass protests. There will be mass protests internally inside of Israel. I know that most people think. No, they will probably get more violent and they'll be more angry and certainly there will be some radicalization, okay? Do you think the protests will do anything? It won't just be regular ass protests. This, <clears throat> there is a, uh, there are so many interesting dynamics that occur in Israeli existence on a daily basis, some of which is very funny, some of which is, is incredibly violent. Uh, one aspect of this also, you're underestimating the right-wing votership that this sort of event will breed, this will flip uh, side of Israel's action breeding terrorism. I mean, it, it already exists. The violence is constant. The violence is every, every existence for, for a Palestinian, okay? Remember, they did a prisoner swap for one prisoner and they gave, a th they released a thousand Palestinians from prison for one Israeli, uh, for one Israeli military person, okay? Now they have hundreds. Why haven't they immediately wiped out the entirety of Gaza? They're bombing Gaza. The bombing has the bombing campaign has been more ruthless and more brutal. Okay, the bombing campaign has been more ruthless and more brutal than uh, in in prior years. However, it's not new. If you're in Gaza, they fucking bomb you all day every day. They haven't done. They haven't leveled Gaza. Without hostages, they would have leveled Gaza one hundred percent. They are gearing up for a ground operation instead of leveling Gaza. Do you want to know why? Because they have hostages. That's the reason why they are gearing up for a ground operation. So they can be more targeted. 